Very good morning. Uh, I must thank uh, my supervisor for this meeting, uh, uh, the department for parking and uh, for this meeting task for giving me this opportunity to present this, uh, these cases to you today. All right. Um, I have uh, picked up three uh, cases of patients with schizophrenia. Um, all of them actually have interesting uh, points uh, for discussion and came up with highlights. All right, let's look at the first case. All right, uh, this patient, Ms. PNH, she's a 25-year-old Indian Muslim lady, uh, single, she's a post-graduate student. Um, she had abnormal behavior for the past eight months uh, with a recent history of aggressive and suicidal behavior for two weeks. She had just returned home from a crowd eight months ago and at the airport when her parents went to pick her up, they found that she was actually wheeled out on a wheelchair, looked to be disheveled and returned clothes and messy hair. And upon seeing her parents, uh, she got up and hid behind the suitcase, appearing very scared and suspicious. And over the next few days, she began to isolate herself uh, and very poor personal hygiene, talking to herself, smiling and talking to And of course, the parents, you know, at that time, uh, decided to take her to see a traditional healer. And they've been doing this for many times over the last eight months, where uh, the traditional healer is performed rituals. The big patient of uh, what he believed that uh, was a demonic profession. Right? So he used to do uh, alien rituals, you know, even uh, that kind of striking the patient in the face. You know? But two months ago, uh, this is prior to admission, the patient began telling her cousin that she was actually raped by the grandfather when she was eight. What happened was, when the patient was 15 years old, the family had invited a traditional healer from India as a proposal, a, a marriage proposal for this patient. And at that time, the grandfather did not like this man. So this traditional healer uh, was very angry and being rejected. And he attempted to entice the patient away by telling the patient that she will be raped by her grandfather. By that time, the grandfather was 18 years old and he uh, was actually dead later. And the poor man actually passed away about two to three weeks after that. So three days prior to admission, she was very restless, had poor sleep, had stress and several thoughts, and attempted to jump off the 17th floor of a flat. And also I think to the strike of mother with a knife. So again they went to this home where she then you know, became very, very aggressive, started pulling out her hair, snapping herself, rolling on the ground, she even gave the bomo a zap. And so when the bobo slept the patient is okay, when the patient slept the bobo and went back to the hospital, <laughs> so the bobo may further the hospital. So in the world, she complained that you know, she could feel her grandfather raping her, she was sexually disinhibited, and also became very religiously preoccupied. So actually, her one set of illness actually began six years ago, when she was 19, while pursuing an undergraduate when she had an affair with a married man at that time and he, of course she didn't know that she became pregnant and so happened she aborted the pregnancy. So the family feels that, you know how the symptoms began then, that's when was, that she started executing her first uh, sign and symptoms of mental illness. There's no history of family, uh, uh, history of uh, mental illness in the family, no history of substance abuse. Alright, uh, of course she had uh, in the mental state examination, she had a vast range of uh, psychopathology. And very, very suicidal in the war, you know. You know, she used to express the suicidal thoughts, you know. Very, very poor plans to commit suicide. You know, I don't like hanging by jumping off the building, by slipping on the floor. And she used to smile at us while telling us this. Alright, so all the good investigations and the routine investigations that we had done, you know, would have been normal. She initially was put on Miss Pentagon for the first sleep, of course the dose of uh, 6 milligrams, and then we realized that she was not improving. We switched to a lanthanine, and uh, as we settled over the next three weeks that she stayed with us, uh, we discharged her well. She comes to regular follow-up now. Uh, instead of studying a lot, we 
for your family, why don't you know you uh, have to continue your studies here so they have time left. But of course the family, being so traditionally uh, uh, deep-rooted in uh, their beliefs, uh, they were in denial that she had mental illness and they of course still believe that uh, she was being possessed because of their strong beliefs in the paranormal. Of course we tried to psychoeducate them. So the important point in this case that I like to bring up number one, six years having symptoms before coming to seek treatment. This is a little too long. This is what we call the duration of untreated psychosis. Uh, so in our National Mental Health Registry for Season uh, up to data up to 2005, they have been shown that the average duration for a patient to seek treatment from the time they develop symptoms to the initiation of antipsychotic treatment is about 28 months. So that's about roughly two and a half years. This patient, six years, that's almost 72 months. So instead of trying to reduce this, you know, uh, we get a lot of patients like this who come after a long, long period of time. But why do they do this? The study was done in the US before, you know, to see uh, um, patients with mental illness or, or symptoms. Where did they go? They found that a large number of these patients actually seek treatment from traditional leaders as before coming to uh, uh, mental health care providers. So how do we tackle this problem uh, when the family has this kind of uh, beliefs? We can't really tell them, oh no, no, beliefs are not important. Because we need the family, we need the family to support us in managing this patient. We need them to understand that you know, this is the form of mental illness that requires medication. So we can't just shut them off. You know, and tell them, oh no, you know, um, your, your religious beliefs, your spiritual beliefs are not important. No. So what do we have to tell them? Okay, Machi, Pone, Pakwa, Tepake, So Pakwa, Tepake, 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 Pakwa, uh, so we try to strike a compromise with them and then this is one way where we can ensure patients will be compliant and the family will, will serve patients' medication. And of course, this patient you know uh, when we have first been following her up, she's been doing well and uh, she will be uh, going back to continue her master's soon. The second case, alright, uh, this is the um, a case that we dealt with in the community setting. Um, this is Miss CHH, the 43 year old Chinese lady. Uh, she's a music teacher. The known case of psychiatric illness uh, has been under the community service, uh, psychiatric service in hospital bar. Uh, in September of 2010, uh, the home care team received a call from patient's mother saying that no patient is behaving at all in the past two weeks. She uh, locked up the house, closed up all the windows, and was hiding in the room. And the patient told her mother that the patient was spying on her and using CCTV and that she felt that she was being attacked by them. She had to sleep at night and refused to clean, refused to eat the food prepared by her mother because she felt that these unknown people were using her mother to poison her. So she took all the cooking utensils you know, from the kitchen, the gas stove, up to her room and started cooking for me to them. So the mother was okay that she would burn the house down. Of course she had poor personal hygiene and you know. Uh, but just before the whole care staff could uh, arrive at her home, she ran away. Uh, and uh, she actually had called a taxi who was waiting outside the house. She packed up a suitcase of clothes and told her mother that she was going to Singapore by train. Uh, upon the invitation of uh, Lee Kuan Yew. So on the 6th of September, uh, mother received a call from Changi Hospital. The patient was arrested by the police for walking around the airport and crying, screaming, and claiming that she was uh, trying to stop the drivers from closing in the air. And she told the doctors that she was invited to Singapore by the country. On the 13th of September, the home care team were informed that the patient had safely returned home. Mother had to go all the way there and bring her back to the flight. So when we visited her, she, uh, uh, our case manager, staff nurse, uh, 
legjobb az a fésült táros, és ez még használom, hogy ez így az a rúg, az meg nehez. És egy tendet fésült, hogy szív treatmentben, mint egy hamar injection, vagy fésült, hogy fűz. A kérdés az not meant to do, az a bonyi két pályt, hogy mondjuk, hogy nem semmi nincs szó. Ez van hát szóval, hogy már van egy olyan plan, ez a police office, az egyik kém, ahol olyan try to call the patient, és az egy olyan option, ahol itt a receiving injection, a hospitalization. But sometimes, you know, in this situation, we have to uh, be a little strict with patients sometimes. You know, sometimes it's difficult you know, when we are having the bus, uh, or public symptoms. We have to do this. So she find the like, idea for injection, so the doctors give her an injection of the pace, so we have to pace them and do things. Two days later, she came to a clinic with her mother, a pure farmer. She came with that, you know, she had some next uh, cause and certain process to appear to her, they might not be told that we take her, her bed and new staffers and TV were referring to her, and also she had other people's patients. Her answer of illness began in 2005, following her father's death and her take up with her boyfriend, and then she had the three prior admissions to hospital and the people he thought treatment. The eldest brother has all sisters in the room and he is standing in the same home. She has a double major in music and education from Mr. Cameron. No history of substance disorder, but a well educated uh, lady. So, what do we do? So, this case manager uh, from our home care team, uh, this uh, community service, upon arrival at Mrs. CH's home, made a quick assessment of the type, severity, and duration of the presenting crisis. So patients' symptoms, both the psychiatric symptoms, the physical as well as the risk of harm to herself and to others to herself. And we usually use what we call the threshold assessment plate. Uh, this is to assess uh, the patient who is undergoing this current crisis. So based on this assessment, we will know whether we can manage the patient to live this crisis in the community or whether she requires admission to us. Um, so, the choice of treatment here, the best one was a mask for this patient because we thought that she, you know, was just not going to be very compliant based on her past history. So she required a death for injection, which she had so we just to get blocked inside the whole throat and the next two times twice weekly. But for the choice of uh, oral medication, she clearly understood, but for the reason I've not been taking my medication in the past, because look, I don't want the side effects. I don't want to walk like a robot. You know, I don't want the cameras. I don't want to you know, saliva drooling. Um, and I don't want to gain weight. So it's fine, okay? We will give you everything to go. Patient agreed to take it. We later uh, obtained the event to push it up to 13 grams. Patient was happy, her mother was happy, and uh, of course we were very happy because uh, we managed to prevent one admission in the hospital. Psychosocial intervention, of course, uh, our acute home care team. Uh, this home care team of community service actually comprises of the multidisciplinary team of psychiatrists, medical officer, staff nurse, attendant, our uh, occupational therapist, and uh, social worker. So most of the time when we go over and visit, the whole team goes around. Uh, so we can look into not just their psychiatric needs, but also uh, other needs as well. So this is just uh, the form of use that uh, I can assure that this is just an example. Okay. Um, and of course, once the participants have settled, then they look into their additional needs, you know, Mr. Schwab mentioned this thing. So we use what we call the temporal assessment of needs short of appraisal at your on campus. So this is uh, Kansas. There are about 23 different needs that we look into and we do community service. So we try to uh, fulfill all of them. What we have is, um, if we call them unmet needs and net needs. So if the needs are unmet, then we try to convert them to net needs. Right? So for example, let's say, um, uh, all right, let's say accommodation. Okay, the patient's uh, patient is paid, for example, let's say he's in a, he's in a village, in a campo, with no electricity, no water, this may have been under this case. So how do we improve his, uh, his living condition? 
Right. So, for example, we got the purple kampong there to say, okay, this man is living without electricity, without water, you know, he's using rain water to, uh, to put this rice, you know, uh, you know, this can't be happening. So, uh, what we did was, okay, get the neighbor to uh, target the wire electric from his house, you know, uh, try to this man's house, and make an extension of the pipe which your neighbor will be, and there you go, patient has electricity and water. Uh, these are the simple things that you know, we can do to assist patients uh, to get better. Another thing is, for example, money, you know, I think this one, uh, most of these patients are uh, uh, poor patients. When we go to visit them, especially the one asked me, that's like the one who came and all that. Uh, it's quite sad to see. But how can we assist them? We have to okay new mentors. You know? So when we go to our home visit, we take the forms along with us. You know, and we immediately fill up the forms there, you know, they have no money to take the photos and all that, you will take the photos and develop it in the hospital and then, you know, there are social worker to uh, uh, get the uh, process going, you know, to get their money. So this is uh, some of the ways that we can help patients, you know, by looking into their needs. This is the second case. Right, the final case. This is uh, Miss R. G. She's a 16 year old Malay girl. Only uh, to the town, but she's on the phone now. She's a known case of mental illness, first diagnosed when she was 14, when our child and child had gone through the follow up. Uh, she had two admissions within a very short period this year, uh, before that, she had been pointed uh, treatment for one year. So on the 27th of July, she had a normal behavior in school, that's why she was eating fast, uh, running around the school field, eating her head against the goalposts. And then she disappeared from school and was found by the police for 20 kilometers away from her house. She felt as if her body was being controlled by the external force and a very suspicious force of the other and that they had kidnapped her when she was a baby. She was previously on this particular one, treated prior to this admission and prior to bonding with them after six weeks. That time she was managing quite well before the bonding with them. So on the second admission, she became very, very aggressive. But first, from the first admission, in started, she was relatively okay. Um, second admission, very, very aggressive at home, assaulted the father and sister, threatened the little mother with knife, um, just not compliant to the medication at all. So on the day of admission, she was very restless in school, banging her head against the table, unable to bear the auditory hallucinations. The stopping the stuff, the irrelevant speed, also had normal behavior in the war, you know, trying to climb the window to go and go and go slow. But what happened to her was this, she actually assaulted her father in the war, you know, when he came to visit. So, past that question is she, she was specially diagnosed at age of 30, admitted once each in 2009-2010, was on uh, treatment, was spending well at the time. Many good students were in school, even at some state days, in PMR state days, so school team had active in sports, member of the Red Packing Society. Very, very good student. So, what do we do? Um, she was only kind of this early on, but fortunately, you know, see many, you know, whenever we have one of the cases, you know, we always bring up doing our morning chat and get feedback from all the other professors and consultants. They say, oh, this patient might get a bit of publicity. So after doing all the case time and investigations, we uh, after this patient of publicity. And over a period of two weeks, we increased the dose of 200 and 200 patients. Symptoms improved tremendously. And uh, the patients are very happy. With the equipment, the weekly FPCs, tomorrow, the patient was discharged well, uh, the higher level of the chair of the weekly FPCs for 16 weeks. So, this case, we um, just like to highlight that some patients, you know, sometimes we just have to look at the uh, advantages and disadvantages of something, certain types of medication for them. This is a child you know, who has a lot of potential. And who is going to sit for SPM next year. So it's very pertinent that we try to uh, relieve the symptoms immediately. She has the potential uh, to uh, go back to school, to study, to pursue uh, her dreams. So we will help her to a certain extent. Uh, hopefully, that of course, uh, she will be compliant with her education. We have given a family an adequate psychoeducation because positive requirements. Uh, 
I speak one of you. Thank you so much.